see if this now works. This is the person I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, I've got a lot of pictures of him. Okay, uh, there's another one of him. Um, these are also the same person. So, my first question, particularly, um, and by the way, if you happen to know where I'm going with this, thank you, then uh, please stay quiet because I want to give a chance for those who don't know to have a guess. So, um, Matty, Noah, um, Merrin, Jacob, I know this is a really hard question. Give me an idea as to where you think that person comes from based on what you can see in that picture. Any ideas at all? What nationality are they? Poland. Poland. Jewish. Anything else? Anybody? German. 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 Danish. Danish. Swedish. Polish. Swedish. English. We're getting a lot of European countries, aren't we? Here's English. <coughs> Here's another clue. Uh, now what can you see? German. What tells you he's German? <laughs> Anybody see? The There's a badge here with a swastika, you can just see it. Now, of course, the fact that he's wearing a German uniform of some kind with a swastika on it doesn't guarantee that he's German, actually. But he certainly seems to be somebody who is uh, either by, either deliberately or through force, is involved with the, the German military of some kind, okay? Um, actually, that's his name. His name is Helmut Wostrak. And um, he was born right at the end of 1920. Now, it's interesting that people said Poland or Germany. That's actually where he was born. That's a map of Europe. He was born in a town called Meseritz. You can see that that is in what country? Poland. Yeah, but it isn't. Or it wasn't. Because if you go back to when he was born, actually, Meseritz was in what was then East Prussia, part of Germany. So he was born a German. Okay? <coughs> he um, was conscripted into the German army. And around the outbreak of World War II, we don't know exactly when, and he did his training, he was then sent in that direction. <coughs> anybody, anybody any idea where they think he was therefore sent? Russia. Russia, Russia to be more specific, about the, Leningrad. And so the name of the campaign that he was part of was? Avaros. Yeah, with the Russian front. He was sent to the Russian front. Now, if you're not aware, the Russian front was one of the most appalling and barbaric of all of the theatres of World War II. The loss of life was absurd. Um, Tony was telling me that he's just come back from the SOP, and we know that that is something from World War I, where the loss of life was frankly ridiculous. Beyond imagination. Russian Front was pretty desperate as well. It was brutal. Um, I'm, I'm just going to read this out. This is written by Adolf Hitler to the German people in 1941. With the except, with the German, while the German homeland is not directly threatened by the enemy, with the exception of air raids, millions of our soldiers, after a year of the most difficult fighting, confront a numerically and materially far superior enemy at the front. Victories as never before witnessed in world history have been secured in battle thanks to the conduct and bravery of officers and men. The greatest front of all time holds its own and fights from the polar regions to the Black Sea, from the snowfields of Finland to the mountains of the Balkans. So he's talking about the Russian campaign. And it will do so until the hour of the final destruction of this most dangerous enemy has come again. And then he says this, if the German Volk wish, wishes to give something to its soldiers at Christmas, then it should give the warmest clothing that it can do without during the war. In peacetime, this could be replaced. In spite of all the winter equipment prepared by the leadership of the Wehrmacht, that's the German army, and its individual branches, every soldier deserves so much more, the homeland can help here. This will show the soldier at the Eastern Front. But what he's fighting for is not an empty phrase in nationalist, socialist Germany. So there's a cry from Hitler for the German people to provide warm clothes. 
And actually, that's because the soldiers, the German soldiers in Russia, badly, badly needed them. Here's something that was written by a German, uh, a German, somebody in the German army on that, in that campaign. We had our anti-tank gun, two heavy and three light machine guns, and plenty of ammunition. We slept on hay spread over boxes of bullets and grenades. We had a stove for warmth and a rifle oil lamp for light, but that was all we had. We burned the fencing and finally the flooring. For 12 days we lived on potatoes, which we boiled with a little salt. We found some green, I guess that's a vegetable, I don't even know what it is, to smoke. To, or we made do with hay. We drank snow melt. There was no soap. Each of us had just one thin blanket, tangled hair and beards, black hands, and most of us either festering and frostbitten or eaten alive by lice, scabies, and inflammations on our legs. When we went out to do sentry duty, we wrapped ourselves in our threadbare blankets, but our icy feet drove tears of pain and rage to our eyes. That's what it was really like. It was actually a lot worse than that. And there are things I could say about it that I'm not going to say because of children present and sensitivities of the morning, okay? But it was truly terrible. Um, <coughs> I'm going to read out something that was uh, written by a family member of his much more recently. It says this. What I know of the German side and Helmut. He hates wars. He doesn't like to talk about his experiences. I've gleaned this over the last 40 years. He was in the midst of an engineering apprenticeship when the war started, but he was allowed to finish it. When he was eventually conscripted, he was sent to Russia. That was a disaster. As often happens when the politicians are in charge, Hitler sent thousands of troops to Russia without proper boots or clothing to combat the icy conditions. Consequently, train loads of lads were sent back home to Germany with such dreadful frostbite that often their toes and their legs had to be amputated. Helmut was saved because his home was near the German-Polish border and he was a motorbike messenger boy. He managed to contact his parents who had a small holding. Hitler was all for self-sufficiency and amongst other animals his dad kept, his dad kept rabbits. When Helmut was able to visit them he was given a pair of rabbit skin insoles which he could wear inside his boots. When fighting started in earnest, the snow was too deep to get supplies through. The troops had to hack the frozen flesh off the dead horses and eat it raw to stay alive. They couldn't even rescue their wounded friends who were left to die in the snow. Can you wonder he doesn't like to talk about it? Later on, he was trained... Oh, I'm going to stop there, actually, because I'm going to say that bit next. So, this is the sort of stuff he had to put up with. This is a photograph of a uh, Russian soldier who has captured a German soldier. You can, see the look in, you can see the look in the German soldier's eyes. This was a terrible, terrible time. And this man, Helmut Wostrak, saw all of this. He was in the middle of it. He survived because he was one of those. Because they found out he could ride a motorbike, he was given that job. So his job, rather than fighting the snow at the front, was to ferry messages from headquarters to people fighting on the front line. So he was probably given better equipment than the regular soldier, and he got these rabbit skin insults for his boots, and, and his father made him rabbit skin mittens, and that helped prevent him getting serious frostbite. So he had a slightly less brutal experience than some, but he would have seen it all, because he was there for a long time. Then, Eventually, we know that he trained to become a German paratrooper. This is the sort of uniform he would have worn. Um, <coughs> he once said he did seven combat parachute jumps, but nobody's quite sure whether that actually meant seven jumps, including his training, or whether it was training and seven real jumps in the heat of battle. Nobody knows. Okay? Um, we know that eventually he went to Italy, and then he was stationed in France. And we also know that uh, he was in northern France, in Normandy, in June 1944. And we know this because he once said that he was supposed to be dropped as a parachuter onto the beaches to repel the Allied invaders at D-Day. And he didn't, and he never made that jump. And the reason he never made that jump, apparently, is because of the Junkers, one of these, Junkers JD-52, that was meant to take him up, developed engine trouble, and it never took off. Um, as a result, <coughs> excuse me, 
As a result, he was captured. Five days after the D-Day landings, he was captured. He had a bullet, bullet wound in his shoulder. So he would be like these German troops. This is a picture in July 1944 of a British soldier escorting captured German soldiers. And he would have been like them. And he didn't know what was going to happen to him. And he had a bullet wound in this shoulder that went right, that went right through and out the other side. And eventually, he was brought to the UK. Um, let me just read the rest of what I started to read. He was sent to France where he was shot in the back by a sniper. The bullet went straight through his body and came out the other side. The war ended for him. The Allies shipped him over to a POW hospital, initially in Scotland, where his festering wounds were finally treated. We know he got treatment nine days after he was shot, we know that. The trauma did not end for his parents. They were forced to leave their home in, in East Germany, which had been built by Helmut's dad, who was a builder by trade, and Helmut had helped when he was a teenager. Listen to this. They were forced to leave their co home and they had to leave the key in the door and leave carrying only what they could carry in a case and some food. Helmut always remembers his mother packed his Sunday suit instead of taking something extra for herself. A train took them away. There was no privacy. They were, they were herded in like animals, no room to sit down. When they wanted to wee, a pot was passed around, the contents chucked out the window. They became refugees themselves and their home was given over to the Poles. Helmut never went back. Germany was divided up into sections. The Russians in charge of East Germany. Living conditions were very poor. Money from East Germany was used to help the Russians. There were shortages in all areas. So he never went back. And he never went back because of the situation that was left at home for him. So he was shipped to one of these camps. Now, they were all over the country. Initially, he went to Scotland. As it says... Uh, as it says there, by about 1948, after the war had ended, when a lot of these soldiers were still in these camps, because they were gradually, their, their release was very gradually managed. There were about 600 camps, absolutely everywhere. There were so many of them. Um, this is a photograph from a, um, Eden Camp, which is in Morton in North Yorkshire. And as far as I know, it's the only one left standing. But you can visit it, and it's a museum now, and it's an amazing museum in its own right that shows what it would have been like <coughs> to live in these camps. I found this photograph online, which I find particularly interesting, because Helmut's own experience was the British were incredibly kind to him. When he was captured, he thought he was going to be shot or tortured. He was in total fear of being captured because the German soldiers were all told, if you are captured, you will be treated totally brutally. Now, actually, he'd seen that in Russia, because indeed, German troops captured by Russians generally were treated very, very, very badly. But he actually has never had a bad word to say for the way he was treated by the Allies. And he was, he'd always talked about that. And this photograph is an example of the sort of thing that started to happen to these soldiers. They were in captivity in prison camps in the UK, but gradually they were let out during the day to help the local people. So even while the war was still on, they were let out to help with gardens and farms and things like this. And his experience was that everybody was kind to him. Universally accepting of him and kind to him. Then we get to this point in his life. This is an important piece of paper. I have the original here. It's this. Okay? I'm going to read it to you. Arrangements have been made, this is dated October 1948. It's written to him <coughs> at an agricultural workers' hostel in Wilton, in, uh, in near Salisbury. Dear sir, arrangements have been made for you to take up employment with Mr. Sykes, Rangers Lodge Farm, Laverstock, Salisbury. In this connection, Mr. Sykes will be calling at the Wilton host Hostel on Saturday, October 30th to collect you. This is an offer from essentially the British government through the Wiltshire County Council Agricultural Executive Committee to stay. It's an offer to say, we can use you, you're welcome here. And it was the first job that he got 
1948, and it marks the point that he removed from being a prisoner of war to a free man with an income. Very significant moment. <coughs> Eventually, he got married. Uh, he came from an agricultural background. He set up a farm, a poultry farm. And he had got a house. At one point, he owned his Jaguar, which he was very proud of. Uh, he loved his cars. <coughs> you can see a little um, British registered Messerschmitt double car on the right, bottom right there. Okay. Um, he had children. Okay. Um, there we are. He actually had um, two daughters. <coughs> and eventually he had grandchildren. And lived a long life. Now, some of you might be wondering, why are you telling me this and who is this person? Well, this is a picture of him in 1990 on the occasion of his eldest daughter's wedding. Okay? And the picture on the right, he's just starting to walk her down the aisle. So if I just bring that picture up, you might get a bit more of a clue. Ringing any bells yet? Anybody recognising who that is? She's in the room. Because he's my father-in-law. Denise's dad. Okay? Denise's dad. But there she is. That's what she used to look like. <laughs> There's a more recent one. From Christmas two years ago. <coughs> that was his last Christmas. Okay? And some of you have met Anita's mum, who's been here a few times. Now, okay, a man's life in pictures, so what? Why have I bothered to show you that stuff? Well, the first thing to point out is that when I originally was thinking about this, I spoke to Martin about talking around, around Remembrance Sunday because of the wartime connection. And this is the closest week we could get um, to remember of Sunday, which of course is in uh, two or three weeks' time. But there's a lot more to it than that, as you might guess. So what I want to do next is I want to show you that picture. Now, that is the front cover of this. Can anybody read what that says? And if you speak German, are you able to translate it? It says de Armenpos. Anybody, any ideas what that means? Not quite. It actually translates, the nearest literal translation is ancestor pass. Okay? So, let's explore this a little bit. That's the inside cover. So, um, this, is, this, is, this, is the inside, this is the inside cover. Right? Jacob, I'm going to ask you to do something. I want you to be very, very careful with this because it's very old. Right? Go past the. You can have a look inside. I want you to go past the first few pages to where you. you can, yeah, go past these typewritten pages. There's a whole load of typewritten intro. And then you get to. Here we go, next pages. Right? I want you to go to the next one. Right? Have a look. What, can you, what do you think? Just tell me in a minute. What do you think you can start to see there? This is a booklet that's got a load of typewritten stuff, and then a load of other things that look like this inside. <clears throat> Any thoughts, Jacob, on what you can see there? Any ideas at all? People. People, okay. Lots of people, and what information can you see on there? You can see dates, good. Date, date of birth, did you say? Yeah. Okay. So when I found this, and I started looking through this, I didn't know what it was. Now, eventually I looked up the Arden Pulse online, and I found out more information as well. But, but this is what I saw. And um, every single one of those entries 
that's got that on it. Can you see that there, Jacob? Yeah, you can see each of these. What are they? Stamps. And what's next to each stamp? Signature. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stamps and signatures. So every entry is stamped. What's it stamped with? The symbol of Nazi Germany. Sorry, David, I'm moving around too much. I do apologise. The symbol of Nazi Germany is stamped on each entry. Now, there's, a, there's one particular entry in this book that's the oldest one that I can find in there is that one. It's later on in the book. It's not actually stamped. But the date, if I zoom in, 1781. Ooh, wow. Any thoughts on what this is? Your, your history. Your history. It's a family tree, guys, but it's, each entry is stamped. Now, what's particularly sad is that when you read about how these were derived, they actually had to be confirmed by the local, um, by the local church. The church was used to verify your family history, which was then officially stamped as being, yes, we agree that this is what it was. Why would you have to verify some kind of family history? Why would you need a document like this? Say you weren't Jewish. Say you yeah. weren't Jewish. This is proof that Helmer has a family history that is not tainted. This is proof of his true Aryan Germanness. Okay. Um, actually, it turns out that you had to prove this back three generations, which is why that 17, that's why that 1781 one never got stamped. It actually wasn't needed. This is proof that he was good enough. That's what this is. This is proof that he's acceptable. Why do we care about that? What's the point I'm getting to? Well, you might have spotted it by now. Let's think about what God says about our acceptability. Okay? There's so many verses I could have chosen. I just want to highlight three. Actually, the first one that really just struck me as terribly, terribly relevant to his experiences in the prisoner of war camp. From Leviticus, right from the early part of the law of the Old Testament. Okay? This is not New Testament grace. This is way before that. And what does it read? It says, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. So here we have in the Old Testament this call, essentially, which Jesus echoed, love your neighbour as yourself. But your neighbour could be a foreigner living in your land. I am, I suppose, quite proud of the fact that Helmer always said that the British treated him with care and respect. All the time. Actually, by accident or by design, his experience of our nation was that. Which is amazing, actually. Now, of course, the truth of <coughs> whether we're good enough or not comes out in other verses. You see, we're not. Let's be honest. We're not. Romans 3. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're not good enough for God. But he accepts us anyway because he's done what he needs to to wipe the slate clean. Galatians 3. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. In other words, God doesn't need you to have something like this. He doesn't care. He doesn't need a history of you to prove that you're good enough. That you descended from the right people. That you haven't got the wrong thing written in your little book. Quite the opposite. He says, makes no difference. It's irrelevant. Completely irrelevant. One of my favourite books when I was a teenager was this. I think it was written in 62 written by uh, Reverend David Wilkerson in the US. And if you don't know who he was, because he has died now, died a couple of years ago, he was, a, in his own words, a skinny preacher from Philadelphia. A uh, skinny white preacher from a small town church. And he felt the call of God to go into inner city New, New York 
and minister to and evangelize the gangs there that were killing each other. Um, absolutely ridiculous. I mean, just an absurd thing for somebody like him to do. But God was with him. And the story is amazing. And he wrote this book called The Cross and the Switchblade. It was made into a major motion picture. Um, and I want to give you a couple of quotes from it. One of the things he found as he started to share his faith with gang members was they literally had such a downer on themselves. They didn't believe in themselves and they didn't believe anybody could love them. They didn't believe they could be accepted. One of the girls pulled up her sleeve and asked if God could forgive this. And she showed lots and lots of scars of taking heroin. Interestingly enough, later in that same chapter, he writes this. I finally got it figured out, Reverend Wilkerson, said the girl. Christ's love is a love with no strings attached. This is all about strings attached. Very, very big ones, indeed. Our faith, the message of the gospel is, there are no strings attached. Helm spent the final weeks of his life in this very unassuming red brick building here. <coughs> Looks pretty dreadful. Um, that was his room, there. What it doesn't show is the view from his window. Okay? Which was that? In South Devon. Now, let me just tell you a little bit more about him. To be honest, he was quite a difficult man. I'm not going to pretend he wasn't. Probably a lot of that to do with his wartime experiences. And most of the time that I knew him, so I knew him for, what, 30 years, um, he, he was very hard on everybody else, but he was also very hard on himself. And he just got the sense that he carried this impossible level of guilt of what he'd been part of. And he grew up in the kind of, he grew up in what we call a Lutheran church if you, uh, in Germany. It was, a, it was Protestant. Uh, but very, uh, I would call it legalistic, his experience, very rules-based. And his, his, the way he saw the world was, it was all about following the rules. But you got the very clear sense from him that he was absolutely petrified of dying, guys. He was so frightened of death. And Anita and I realised that probably... This was because he genuinely believed there was a God. He certainly did. But his guilt about his past, his legalistic view of religion, meant that he believed there was a God who was not going to be very happy with him when they finally met. He thought he was going to the wrong place. In the last few years of his life, he developed a little bit of dementia. And funnily enough, it gradually changed and by the time he was, had this view, he was saying, this is heaven, I'm happy, I'm at peace. And he meant it. And Nita, I'll never forget, and Nita had a really amazing conversation once with him where she shared with him the truth about the grace of Jesus and his acceptance of us. And something shifted in his spirit over a period of a year or two. It really did. And I believe he came to a place where he knew the truth. Okay? He knew that none of this mattered. He knew that he was accepted and he knew that he was loved. So we're left with a very simple perspective. Do we live under the need to fulfil one of these? Or do we live under this? You're welcome. You're welcome to stay. You're welcome here. Okay? That's what this says. Um, there's, that, there's that piece of paper again, and I've rewritten it. Okay? Forgive me for doing this, but just to make the point. So I've slightly edited it. So instead of it saying, arrangements have been made for you to take up employment with Mr. Sykes, Rangers Lodge Farm, Laverstock, Salisbury, in this connection, Mr. Sykes will be calling at the Wilton Hostel on Saturday, October 30th to collect you. Okay? It now says this. Arrangements have been made for you to take up permanent residence with the Lord God Almighty, Palace Avenue, Heaven. In this connection, he will be calling upon you on the occasion of your death to collect you. Uh, 
Um, I had the privilege of speaking at his funeral, his order of service, and I basically did the same thing I've done today. Much quicker, shorter, more about his life, less overtly about the Christian message. But I was able to end with this same question, to point out that his life had been led, let, lived under the curse, and I use that word quite deliberately, the curse that says you're not good enough. Prove it, prove it, prove it, prove it. But that actually he had the experience of something that basically represents grace. You're welcome. Be blessed. Join us. Never mind what's happened. You're welcome here anyway. Okay? I was able to say that at his funeral, which was such a privilege. And I, want to, I, I just want to ask you the same thing. Most of you are part of this church, you understand the Christian gospel. If you are searching, seeking, thinking it through, if you're not sure what God's about, you hear conflicting things in the media, you, you, you struggle with the Christian message, let's just get it, distill it down to the simple stuff. Forget all the heavy theology. Forget all the why does God allow this, and what about this, and what about this, because actually the truth of it is we don't know. What we do know is this. The world says, and worldly systems say, prove it. We'll only accept you if you're good enough. What God says is, never mind what you've done. You're welcome. You're welcome anyway. That's what it comes down to. And if you're somebody who is <coughs> on that journey of trying to understand the Christian faith, please understand that at its heart, that's what it says. Which is why that famously quoted verse from John chapter 3, verse 16. God loved the world so much, he gave his son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the message. I do have a further thought for you, church, for those of you who are Christians. Because this is more than a gospel message. You see... <coughs> It seems to me a huge number of Christians continue to live their lives under some form of self-imposed curse or self-condemnation. Some of you here this morning may well be sitting here knowing fully well that you still beat yourselves up about stuff you did, mistakes you made, things you got involved with, or that ultimately deep down there's an insecurity there that says, I'm not really that lovable. I'm not really special, I'm not really important, I'm not sure I'm good enough. Well, actually, no, you're not, none of us are. But the message of the gospel of Jesus is, never mind. And I kind of feel it's really timely to say, if you are somebody who knows you struggle with guilt, like Helmut did, you know you struggle with stuff you did in the past, and it's a constant, constant battle to let go of it, how about go again? Have another go this morning. Go afresh at saying, I want to put that behind me once and for all. So here's what I've got. I have got just some simple, basic photocopies of the front cover of that ancestor pass and also that piece of paper that says, from the Agricultural Commission in Wiltshire, you've got a job, you're welcome. If you, if you want, we're going to pray in a moment, okay? If you want to just say, I am putting my guilt behind me once and for all, come and take one of these Ancestor Past covers, take it and rip it up. Yeah, Symbolically say, enough. Yeah. No more. And if you want to be reminded of the fact that you've been given a place and you are accepted anyway, take a copy of this little thing from this job offer, just take it home as a reminder. Pin it to your fridge, do what you want to do with it, okay? Can I ask that? You know, this doesn't necessarily apply to everybody, of course it doesn't, but I felt it's really important to provide that opportunity and that challenge. Because we as a church want to be a church of people that go forward and that we've dealt with our baggage. Because God says, do you know what? Never mind about that stuff. I want to take you forward. One of my favourite phrases is, don't let your future be defined by your past. Or don't let your past define your future. And maybe you know that at times you still allow your past to define your future. And I'm just saying, here's a chance to come and say afresh, no more. And you can get prayer for that. We would love to stand with you in prayer for that. For that. So.